Welcome, folks. We have a very special treat for you today, our Intro to Law students. Uh, Professor Dayton is interviewing Secretary of Agriculture Thomas Vilsack. Uh, he is the 32nd United States Secretary of Agriculture, and he was also the 30th Secretary of Agriculture. You might recognize him as the 40th Governor of Iowa from 1999 to 2007. Uh, Secretary Vilsack has uh, deep Iowa roots. He began his career as a lawyer here in Iowa in Mount Pleasant. He practiced there became the uh, mayor of that town, went on to further elected office, was our, our governor for two terms, and now has had two very high profile US cabinet appointments. So I really wanna thank Secretary Vilsack for taking the time to talk to us and talk to you, our students, and thank you, Professor Dayton, for putting this together, this wonderful opportunity for our students. So check it out. Hi, students. Uh, this is Professor Dayton here. It's February 12th, 2021, and I am here with Secretary Vilsack. Um, and Secretary Vilsack, thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, can you, just to start off, tell us a little bit about your background? What was it like growing up uh, for you? Well, I start out to... Um life in an orphanage in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And as a very young, very young baby, I was adopted into a family, uh, the Vilsack family. I lived in Pittsburgh all of my uh, childhood, uh, raised by my mom and dad. My dad was a realtor. Mom was a, uh, initially a stay-at-home mom, uh, struggled a bit with uh, some addiction issues while I was growing up. Uh, my parents uh, split for a short period of time, a couple of years, then got back together. I uh, was fortunate enough to have a great education. My parents believed strongly in the importance of education and had a great high school education and had a chance to go to Hamilton College in upstate New York, uh, where I met my wife, Christy. Uh, and she was from a small town in Iowa. Uh, when we graduated from college, I went to law school. Uh, she began teaching uh, in Clinton, New York, which is where Hamilton is located, uh, at uh, the Waterville High School. Uh, she taught there for three years. Uh, we got married uh, after her first year of teaching and my first year of law school. Uh, we lived in Richfield Springs. And then when I graduated from law school, we had the opportunity to come back to our hometown of Mount Pleasant, uh, where I could practice law with my father-in-law. And over a period of time, my brother-in-law joined us as well in a family practice. Uh, we did a little bit of everything. Uh, we practiced uh, real estate law and family law. I did a lot of trial work. My brother-in-law was in the workers' comp and uh, criminal law the defense and my father-in-law did a lot of estate uh, estate planning had a very very good practice uh, enjoyed it had a lot of fun at it uh, the mayor of our town was uh, shot and killed in a council meeting in 1986 and because of my earlier involvement with my wife christy in joe biden's first presidential campaign uh, we decided uh, when the mayor's father asked if i would consider running for mayor to fill out his son's legacy and to finish some of the projects that the Senate had started, uh, decided to get involved in politics. And uh, that job uh, led to a state Senate job, which led to uh, being governor of Iowa for eight years. Uh, I thought my political career was over. I went back to practicing law uh, at a law firm here in Des Moines. Uh, the Dorsey and Whitney firm uh, was uh, about ready to take over their trial practice uh, when President Obama asked if I would be willing to be Secretary of Agriculture. And I served in that capacity for eight years. And when I left that job, uh, ended up working for the dairy farmers as uh, the president and CEO of the U.S. Dairy Export Council, and also had an opportunity to be a strategic advisor to the chancellor of the Colorado State University system. Uh, and most recently, uh, and I'll finish with this, had a chance to be the monitor uh, in a bankruptcy proceeding involving Purdue Pharma, a manufacturer of opioids who had gone into bankruptcy, uh, had entered into a voluntary injunction and it required the monitor uh, to review uh, the compliance with that injunction. Uh, so I had a little practice of law opportunity uh, in that line of work. Uh, and then uh, President Biden asked if I would be willing to return to uh, the Department of Agriculture and I'm in the process now of awaiting uh, confirmation by the Senate. Well, I have lots of questions I've, uh, that. Happily married. Yeah, happily married, and just I should probably mention I've got two sons. 
one of whom practices law uh, with you, I understand, uh, at the Nine Master Firm. Uh, the other son uh, currently is uh, in charge of the uh, state park system and uh, public lands for the state of Colorado, uh, working for uh, uh, Governor, uh, uh, gosh, I'm, is Polis, Governor Polis. So I, I think the first question I have is, Obviously, the run for mayor was under unusual circumstances. Um, had you thought about uh, getting into, I, I, you mentioned you had helped Biden with his campaign, but have you personally thought about running for any position prior to that? No, uh, Christy and I had always been sort of behind the scenes. We'd. Uh... We'd helped a, a friend of ours become a uh, uh, Henry County supervisor. Uh, we had worked on uh, his campaign and, and that led to an interest in politics. I became the uh, president of the Iowa Trial Lawyers Association that was then called the Iowa Trial Lawyers Association. That got me involved in public policy, uh, representing uh, uh, victims and representing trial lawyer in interests in the legislature, state legislature. It got me interested in politics uh, so that when, uh, and then Senator Biden was running for president. Christy and I decided to get engaged in his campaign. And he often uh, quoted uh, a Greek philosopher that the penalty for not getting involved is that people less qualified than you end up governing you. Uh, and that mantra sort of stuck in my head uh, after he dropped out of the presidential race, the mayor's uh, sh killing and shooting occurred. Um, and I thought to myself, well, uh, as Joe would say, the penalty for not getting involved is the people less qualified than you end up governing you. So I, I gave it a shot. And honestly, I didn't really think I had much of a chance. Our community is pretty much a Republican community. But I had been involved in a number of uh, community activities. I had helped to spearhead uh, the construction of a new athletic complex for, uh, for students at the Mount Pleasant uh, School District, uh, football field, band, um, stadium complex. Uh, and it, we had basically done it in a way that nobody thought was possible. We raised the money without a bond issue and without uh, raising taxes. We actually got people to contribute uh, enough money, enough labor uh, to build it. Uh, and I got sort of a result of that. I got a lot of community leadership opportunities and that led to the people thinking I could be the mayor. Um, and it was a great job. I, I had it for, for two terms. So there were two two-year terms. And at the end of my second term, I, I sort of believe that there's a Democracy works best when there's periodic uh, change, uh, where you basically bring some new thoughts and new ideas and new approaches into into play. Um, and uh, I decided not to run. Uh, unfortunately, nobody ran. Uh, the ballot was pretty much pretty much empty, and uh, there was a draft movement, if you will. Uh, and I ended up getting 97 percent or so of the write-in vote. The 1,200 folks who voted in that election, I got elected the third term. Uh, and then I realized that that was probably going to be a lifetime appointment if I didn't look for another opportunity. And I had been interested in potentially getting into state politics because of my involvement with, with the Trial Lawyers Association. So I ran for the state Senate, uh, served there uh, for six years, uh, really decided that I was not a legislative personality. I think you, I think there are legislative personalities and executive personalities. I, I, I took me six years to realize I was probably going to be happier being in charge rather than being one of a number of deciders. Uh, and that's why I decided to run for governor. Uh, very uphill, very uphill battle um, because we hadn't had a Democrat elected in Iowa for 30 years. Um, and so uh, that whole notion of, of rotation, uh, I, I used a phrase that most Iowans would, would understand that it was time to rotate the crops. Um, and I was fortunate to win that uh, governor's race. What was it like running for governor? I presumably it wasn't quite as money heavy back then, um, but no, running but, things but it, and running things are different. That's right. Uh, there is. Uh, I don't know if this this window is still available on. on uh, I guess it would be. Uh, it's not Grant. It's Locus uh, downtown. Uh, Des Moines and Locust Street, uh, around the sixth, seventh block, uh, there is a, a window in the middle of the block. And that window, uh, when I ran for governor some years ago, uh, was a small room. And in that small room, there was a chair, a 
table and another chair and a telephone. And I spent hour after hour after hour in that room uh, trying to raise money for the governor's race. Now, uh, I, I can't remember what was spent in the last gubernatorial race. I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 20, somewhere between 20 and $30 million, maybe even more than that, but, but conservatively, at least 20 to $30 million. When I ran uh, and I had a primary, for the primary and the general election, I spent $2.3 million. But it was really hard to raise that $2.3 million because I was always behind. I was behind in the primary uh, from the get-go. I was behind by a large margin in the governor's race until about the last two to three weeks. I was, I think, a, a three weeks out, I was 20 points behind. Um, but I kept uh, kept at it. Uh, I had a lot of great support from Christy, and I had a great lieutenant governor candidate, Sally Peterson, and we just worked hard. We just very, worked hard. We traveled all over the state, had a vision for what the state could be, um, and we had great uh, we had a great person helping to market us, to market me, and to market Sally, a guy by the name of David Axelrod. You may have heard of him. Uh, he uh, he was my uh, media person, and David did a great job of of translating me. Uh, in a way that Iowans could accept and, and uh, take a chance on. Um, but it was a lot of it was raising money. I mean, people think running for office is about giving speeches and going to parades and shaking hands and you know debating and all the things that you see on the outside. But the vast majority of the time that you spend in running for office is literally trying to convince people uh, to part with their money. Um, and, be, and it's hard because Initially asking somebody for the kind of money that you have to ask them for, it's really difficult. I mean, I, I, when I first started this, I had a hard time asking people, well, when I ran for the state Senate, I didn't really raise very much money. I raised $15,000. I, I, half of my, half of my uh, campaign fund came from my own pocket. When I ran for governor as a primary, uh, I took a, a fairly large, fee that I had generated from a class action and poured that into uh, into the governor's race. Um, so it was hard for me to ask people for $100, much less asking them for $1,000 or $2,000 or $2,500. Or in some cases, we asked people for $25,000. <laughs> and I will tell you, uh, Sally Peterson taught me how to ask for money. And uh, uh, it's an art. Uh, tr trust me, uh, it's not something that I, I enjoyed doing it. But once you get the job, it's it's a phenomenal job. I mean, you have an opportunity to impact directly three million lives every single day with the decisions you make. Um, and I learned a lot from that uh, from that experience. So, shifting gears, you you've served on the cabinet with President Obama, and then. You will eventually hear in a little bit serve for Joe Biden to President Biden. Can you can you give the students an idea of just what the cabinet is, how it functions, and then your role and as your particular Secretary of Agriculture, just what that looks like? Well, the, the, the cabinet is a collection of really bright people. And I think the I think the understanding is that people in a cabinet basically sit around the table and advise the president on various policies, but it's really not like that. Um, uh, the White House and the executive office building, which is located adjacent to the White House, has several thousand people that work in that complex and they're sort of the center, they're the heart of the operation. Um, uh, and the agencies and Departments are essentially the arms and the legs and the sort of the implementers of the policies that are formulated and the pr priorities are formulated in the White House. Now, you have some input in those priorities, but oftentimes they're dictated by whatever the campaign was about. Uh, so, for example, uh, current administration, obviously, it's about COVID relief, making sure that we get through this, get on the other side of this horrific virus and make ourselves a bit more resilient and rebuild the economy in a stronger way. Uh, it's also about tackling some of the major problems that we as a, as a, as a country have put off for a long period of time, the issue of climate, uh, the issue of racial uh, inequities and injustices, uh, uh, the ability to create uh, an economy that works for, uh, for the middle class, rebuilds the middle class. Uh, so 
those priorities help to define what you do with the enormous uh, capacity of every single department of government. My department, the Department of Agriculture, uh, is an amazing department. Um, somewhere between 90 and 100,000 people work for the Department of Agriculture. Its budget is somewhere between 140 and $150 billion. Uh, to give you a sense of this, when I was governor, uh, even if you included all the people that work at the University of Iowa and Iowa State and U the University of Northern Iowa, we're only talking about 40 or 50,000 folks uh, working for the state of Iowa. And our budget was, even if you included federal resources, somewhere between nine and $10 billion. So it's significantly larger footprint. Um, the Department of Agriculture has offices literally in every county in the, in the country. Every county in the country has a physical presence of some sort of the Department of Agriculture. Every school child is impacted and affected every day in school through the school lunch and school breakfast programs administered by the Department of Agriculture. Today, 42 million Americans are receiving food assistance because of, of the poor economy and COVID. Uh, that is administered and through the department. Uh, the Department of Agriculture is responsible for uh, rural development, so for the expansion of water projects and broadband and housing and business development in rural places. Uh, it also helps to build schools and hospitals and community centers and virtually any kind of community facility that you can think of. That's the reach of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, it's engaged in food safety. Uh, it's, it's sort of a, a bizarre food safety system we have in the, in the country. I always tell people, uh, if you are eating a cheese pizza, then that cheese pizza has been regulated in terms of its food safety by the Federal uh, Drug Administration, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Um, if you're eating a pepperoni cheese pizza, now that pizza is regulated for its food safety by the Department of Agriculture. The reason being that the Department of Agriculture has responsibility for meat, poultry, and processed eggs. The FDA has responsibility for everything else. Don't ask me why that is, um, it just is. Um, and any effort to try to merge the two uh, often gets resistance from Congress because you're talking about jurisdictional issues. So there's a food safety component. Uh, there's a natural resource component. The Department of Agriculture is responsible for 193 million acres of forested lands and grasslands, which are owned by us, the people of America. These are iconic landscapes and it's our responsibility to try to take care of them. And on any given year, there will be between 40 and 70,000 fires, forest fires that have to be fought uh, by the Forest Service on those lands and on adjacent lands that are owned by state uh, uh, by the states. Uh, so it's a it's an enormous department, and it's not just domestic. We have offices uh, in over uh, in and in, in, uh, personnel in over 75 countries around the world because we are engaged in the, in the agricultural trade sector. We help to promote the trade of agricultural products raised and grown in the United States and sold all over the world in Asia, Africa, Europe. Uh, South America, uh, and also Oceania. So it's, a, it, it's just an amazing department. And your job as secretary is to manage that department, uh, to advance the goals of the administration, uh, to advance the goals of whatever you as a secretary set as a priority, and then to make sure that the, the people that you're responsible for, the farmers, the ranchers, the producers, uh, are able to make uh, a living. And I, I, I will tell you that... Uh, there's work to be done in, in, the, in the space that the Department of Agriculture uh, basically operates in. When I say that, when you consider that nearly 60% of American adults have a chronic disease, 40% of American adults have two or more chronic diseases. Uh, one of the principal causes of chronic disease is poor diet. Uh, we have an obesity rate among uh, Americans uh, that is is, is, is astronomically high. And among our children, about one out of every five child, uh, children in this country is obese, not overweight, obese. So there's a, clearly a health, a health issue uh, related to our food system. On the other hand, 90% of the farmers in this country, 90% do not make the majority of their money from farming. Now think about that. Um, so I think the challenge for the Department of Agriculture now and in the future is to transform and reshape, if you will, the food system so that we, we do a better job of providing nutritious food to all Americans, 
regardless of their financial circumstances, uh, that we helped along with our healthcare system to reduce the uh, obesity rates and the chronic disease rates that we suffer from. Uh, so we become a healthier nation. And at the same time, we have to rebuild uh, and restructure, if you will, uh, our ag economy so that more farmers are able to profit from what they do on the land and to do it in a way uh, that promotes uh, uh, healthier soil and cleaner water uh, that will be better for uh, our efforts in reducing the impacts of climate. So not a small challenge, not a small challenge ahead of us. And to do this all in the context of making sure that we are fair and just to all, uh, because the department has had a history of inequities and injustices, especially focused on minorities. So it, it's a it's a big challenge. Well, thank you. And I, I could talk to you all day probably about inequities in the food system and that sort of thing. But for our purposes today, I think I want to shift gears again and just, so you're up for in the process of being confirmed um, to become Secretary of Agriculture again, what what's it like going through that confirmation process, especially especially these? I'll just say especially these days. What, what's it like these days? Well, when I when I was uh, nominated in two thousand and eight, um, uh, the process involved filling out a lot of paper work, um, basically giving uh, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Justice and the FBI uh, a lot of information about where I had lived, what I had done in the past from a job perspective, where I was educated, uh, are my financial circumstances and situation, sort of a, a complete portfolio, uh, w uh, if you will, of who I was from the, that, that would be available for anyone who was interested in trying to see if there was something in my background that would suggest that I was not qualified to take on this responsibility. Uh, pretty, in, uh, pretty intensive, pretty evasive. Um, and, you know, when you, when you put down that 40 years ago, you worked at Tommy Falls uh, Exxon gas station in Pittsburgh, uh, you, you have no idea that the FBI is actually going to call Tommy Fall, uh, who is now probably in his 80s, uh, to ask about a kid who worked at his girl, at his uh, gas station um, 40 years ago for three months. <laughs> you kind of have to hope that Tommy Fall remembers or doesn't confuse you with somebody that may have articulated a desire to overthrow the government or something of those sorts. Uh, so it is, it's, it's a process. And then once you fill out the paperwork, uh, then you have to reach out to uh, the, the members of the United States Senate who will be determining whether or not you are confirmed. Uh, and you reach out specifically to those members of the Agriculture Committee that will pass initially on your nomination. So you are you go in, you introduce yourself, you basically tell the senators a little bit about you, who you are, and you listen to the senators' concerns. Uh, you make notes of, of specific issues uh, that, uh, that senators may, uh, may have. Uh, and then you go and you appear before the Senate committee in public. Uh, you respond to questions that are asked by each committee member. Uh, in addition to the oral questions that are asked, they also submit what are called questions for the record. And oftentimes those can number in 10, 15, 20 per senator. And you provide answers and directions to how you think you will operate the department. Uh, and then it goes to the, the full Senate and of course, there's always a risk when it goes to the full Senate because any one senator can can put a hold on your nomination. They could decide for whatever reason or for no reason. Uh, they just aren't going to, uh, on that particular day and that particular month, they're just not going to let you become the secretary of fill in the blank. Um, and so you have to work around that. You have to either figure out if it's a problem that the senator has with you personally. And if so, how do you resolve it? How do you how do you make sure they are in a better place? Or is it more of a dispute between the two parties and you're sort of caught in the middle and there's not really much you can do, you just have to be patient. Now, in my case, my, the first time I did this, uh, I was nominated, I was confirmed, I was passed on by the uh, Senate Ag Committee unanimously. I went to the floor of the Senate and I think the vote was 99 to nothing. And I got confirmed along with four or five of my other colleagues in the Obama cabinet, the first administration, 
uh, we got confirmed on, on January 20th, the day the president was inaugurated. We were all watching the inaugural parade when the word came out that the Senate had voted in uh, all of the folks who I was <clears throat> watching the, the parade with. And that was 2008, 2009. Fast forward to 2020, 21. Oh my, much different circumstance. Same, part, same paperwork, no question about that. Um, maybe a little bit more detail uh, about your financial circumstances. And when they ask you for, uh, do you own mutual funds? They don't just ask you if you own a mutual fund and what that mutual fund is. You ask, they ask you to break down specifically where that mutual fund has made investments. So you have to tell them that 2.6% of your mutual fund is invested in zero price, you know, high yield bond fund or whatever. And you have to break it down. I mean, it's really, really detailed. Uh, I've been through the Senate Ag Committee and I got voted out unanimously, which is a, a good first step. But I've, there's a hold on my uh, confirmation right now. Um, we're not sure exactly who, uh, which senator put the hold on. But I think it's a, a situation where the two parties are not necessarily uh, cooperating with each other. So at some point in time, uh, since the Democrats control the place, at some point in time, the Democratic leader, Senator Schumer, uh, will make the decision to <coughs> file for closure. Excuse me. And what that means is he will essentially uh, for three consecutive days, bring my nomination up, ask if there's any objection. If there's an objection, they go to the second day, they go to the third day. At the end of the third day, they go, okay, enough of this. Uh, we're going to put this up for vote. Uh, and at that point, 50 senators, 50, 50 plus one, can vote to move the nomination forward. Um, and once that vote's taken, then they, then they vote on the confirmation. Assuming you got 51 votes to move it forward, pretty safe bet you're going to have 51 votes to confirm you and you get confirmed and then you get sworn in. And you basically take the same oath of office that the president takes um, and that we see during, during the inauguration to defend the constitution and so forth. Uh, and then you start. And when you start, you don't start with a full team uh, because <clears throat> under you, there are deputies, administrators, undersecretaries, and all of these are political appoint appointments and many of them require Senate confirmation. So you have to, your whole team has to go through this process. And, they can have holes. Uh, they don't like what you've done uh, in the Forest Service, at, in the Tongass, uh, in, in Alaska. You make a decision early in the administration and maybe a senator says, hey, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I'm going to pull a hold on your undersecretary for marketing and regulatory affairs. And so you don't have the person that would be in charge of that segment of the USDA. So it can be frustrating. Uh, it can be laborious and it can be very time consuming. Is there anything from the first administration you were part of, any of the eight years, that you are most proud of? Well, I I, I would say I'm uh, I was extreme, extremely proud of the of the breadth of things that we were able to accomplish in the eight years I was secretary. Um, the department doesn't often get a secretary for eight years. Uh, there's usually uh, more of a turnover. In fact, if I am confirmed and I serve a week or two, I will be the lo second longest serving uh, Ag Secretary in the history of the country. Uh, Big Jim Tamer Wilson was uh, the longest serving. He, he served 16 consecutive years. I will be the first secretary if confirmed that, has, that, that was there for eight years, left for, for a period of time and then was invited back. Uh, that's not happened before, so this is sort of unique. Um, but during that eight-year period that I was secretary, you know, we, we made progress in virtually every mission area. We had record farm employment. We had record farm export uh, activity. Uh, we passed the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act and made a significant commitment to better nutrition for our children. Uh, we, saw, we saw a significant increase in SNAP participation of, of people that were eligible for the program. Uh, we, you know, we made an effort to try to do more with the Forest Service in terms of more uh, board feet being treated, which creates a, a hopefully a reduced risk of forest fire in, in key areas. Um, you know, we, we passed, uh, uh, you know, at the time, one of the big issues involving equity 
uh, was the uh, was the Pigford cases was there were a series of cases against the department that were ultimately certified as class actions. Uh, one brought by black farmers, one brought by uh, Native American and women farmers. And then there were a series of individual claims that were not certified as a class action brought by Hispanic farmers alleging discrimination against the department. All told, somewhere between 20 and 25,000 claims against the department for a history that goes back to the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, we settled and resolved almost all of those claims. And we got the Congress to give us the resources to get the Pigford cases settled. We created a, a fund for the Keep Sigil, which was the Native American women uh, farmer uh, case. And then we set up a companion um, settlement process for Hispanic farmers who felt they'd been discriminated against. And I was proud of that. Um, it's, you know, at the time that was the big issue. Now, I think we're in a much different place in, in today's America. Um, and I think that there are, um, there's a greater sensitivity to issues that are more systemic, deeply hidden, if you will, within the DNA of, of government agencies and decision makers that we need to sort of uh, identify and change and transform. Uh, so that's obviously going to be a focus of, of uh, the USDA during the next four years in the Biden Harris administration, because the president and vice president have put a premium on rooting out systemic racism that does exist in many programs. What what keeps you up at night right now? If anything. Um, well, I, I'm obviously concerned about the, the food system in the country. Uh, we just can't be satisfied with a system where only 10% of farmers make a majority of their money from farming uh, and where we have so many people in the country that are suffering from chronic disease or are facing a lifetime of, of, of obesity and uh, obesity related uh, consequences. You know, I, th I think we have to, I think we have to uh, realize we've got to, we've got to do better. Uh, and at the same time, we're losing a tremendous amount of our topsoil, which is basically the, you know, it's the, it's what makes the whole system work. If you don't have soil uh, and healthy soil, it's pretty doggone difficult to grow anything. Uh, and we're gonna face a much stricter and more difficult uh, climate and weather patterns, which are going to make it more and more difficult. So when you combine all of those challenges, it's, it's, it leads you to one conclusion. And that is that there needs to be a comprehensive uh, effort to transform our food system by committing ourselves to health, uh, you know, greater access to healthier choices for Americans, and making sure that they are help, they're helped in making the most informed choice for themselves and their family, uh, and being able to have access to affordable, nutritious food, uh, that's a serious, significant challenge in and of itself. Combine that with the necessity of adjusting to a harsher climate uh, and preserving the precious topsoil and purifying our water, uh, that's a big challenge in and of itself. And the president has laid down a marker by suggesting he wants our agriculture to have no emissions, zero emissions, if you will, by the year 2050. That's a, a major challenge we face. And you then take a look at the fact that uh, today markets aren't necessarily fair for producers of all sizes. That's a pretty big challenge. And then when you, then working through all of that, you're dealing with the inequities and injustices that have been in the system, if you will, for literally decades and having to root those out and getting people to embrace the, a new way of thinking and a new way of doing, a big, big, big challenge ahead. So then the enormity of the challenge uh, keeps you up for two reasons. One, it keeps you up because you're obviously concerned and worried about the consequences if we don't change the enormous healthcare costs that will be accompanied, the, the inequities that, that, that separate uh, minorities, black, white, red, whatever, um, the, the, and the fabric of the country being torn, the rural urban divide, all of this basically keeps you up because you're worried about the consequences. Then at the same time, you're also staying up because you're excited about the opportunities it presents. And indeed, it does present enormous new opportunities to create a healthier rural economy, 
with more income sources for farmers as we pay them to sequester carbon, as we allow them to, uh, to capture methane and convert it into electricity and lower their costs on the farm. And maybe we convert manure into a variety of new bio-based products uh, that create a whole new series of manufacturing jobs in rural places. Excited about that, excited about you know better nutrition for our kids so they're healthier, happier, and better learners, better able to be uh, productive workers and good citizens as they grow up. And so the, the, the potential for the benefits of the change uh, gets you excited enough that it's hard to sleep. Looking back at your 19, 20 year old self, what's one thing you know now that you wish you knew then? You know, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and it, it's the kind of question that you, you find yourself asking when you have to give a commencement speech. Um, which I don't like to do, but I've asked, been asked to do it many, many times. Um, and I used to give a commencement speech where I basically read a children's book that we used to read to our kids uh, called The 49th Magician. Uh, so it's a really interesting story about a king who has 49 magicians in his kingdom and he gets irritated because they're doing too many tricks. And so he has a contest to decide who the best magician is. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, the last magician that he, he sees basically says to him uh, that you've seen a many amazing things today, but I'm gonna make time disappear. And so the king goes, well, you know, you can't make hours, uh, you know, seconds into minutes, minutes into hours until time disappears. You know, no, no magician's that good. So the young uh, magician takes the king outside of the kingdom and they go out into nature and, and they play in the stream and they blow grass through their thumbs and the kinds of stuff you, that we did as a kid, right? Uh, and all of a sudden, somebody from the kingdom comes and says, hey, it's supper time. So the king realizes that, my gosh, the whole afternoon's gone by and I didn't realize, uh, I didn't realize it. Um, this isn't so much a lesson I, I wish I had learned, but I think it's a lesson worth learning which is, is, where, is where and how to find your passion. Uh, because, it, because if you find your passion, if you, if you find what you really, really, really are interested in, you need to pursue it because that's where you're going to find um, happiness or satisfaction or, or, or contentment or however you want to characterize it. And, and the way you know what your passion is, is when whatever it is you're doing, when time doesn't matter. When you think, you know, when you're doing something and all of a sudden two hours has gone by and you're just like, man, this is the quickest two hours in the world. I was really interested in this. Well, that, that's a signal. That's an indication. And I think to the extent that you can focus your energies on that passion, it, it, it will prevent you from having to search high and low for what it is you want to quote unquote do with your life. Your passion is a pretty good uh, the things you're most interested, the thing where time disappears is a way of finding that. And I, what I found in my life is that I like, I like solving problems. I really like solving problems. I like sitting by myself and making a list of things and trying to figure out how to fit the pieces together and how to message it. And when I do that, time doesn't matter. Um, you know, and so so from a professional standpoint, apart from personal, I mean, I've got, I've got a personal passion, but apart from the, on the professional side, that's what I like doing. So I, I look for opportunities to do that. And fortunately, I've, I've had a chance to be a governor and to be a secretary not once, potentially twice, and, 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 and or a state senator or a mayor. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, that's a problem solving job or being a lawyer. I mean, I really enjoy being a lawyer. I've kept my law license. I'm proud of being a lawyer. Um, I, you know, I, they're, they're problem solvers, right? And that's what lawyers do. They try to solve problems. Um, and so that would be a lesson I would want to impart uh, to your students. Figure out what your passion is by figuring out what it, what it is that you do when time doesn't matter. That's great. Is there anything I should have asked you? In our <laughs> well, 
<laughs> there's a lot of stuff I, I'm sure that, uh, you know, I, hopefully this is of, of some interest to your students, but, um, you know, there's a, a tremendous, the, the, the future is, is, in, is incredibly challenging and it's particularly challenging today because of the COVID. But this isn't gonna be the last time we're faced with something like this. Um, and every time, we, every time we see the problem, every time there's a crisis, uh, I would encourage your students to understand that within each of those crises, so this is another children's book that we now read to our grandkids. It's called, What You Do With a Problem. And there's a lot of wisdom in it. I mean, there's a, about a kid who's got a, a problem and the problem is following him. It's like a little blob that follows him. And first of all, he tries to hide it and then he tries to ignore it. And he tries to, you know, he tries to do all the things we do with problems. We, we try to shove it aside. We try to hide it. We try to put it in the closet, not think about it. But finally, he realizes that the way to, to deal with a problem is to find the opportunity inside of the problem. And I would encourage your students as you're looking, as they're looking at the world today, as they can identify a multitude of problems within the world today, and there always have been and always will be problems, figure out what the opportunity is inside of that problem and go after it. Well, thanks, Secretary Vilsack. This was phenomenal. Um, I'm sure the students will love it. I'm going to end the recording now, and then uh, I'll just talk to you for a few minutes. Okay.